Let's take a look at how to set up the Postgre database on your computer. Start by opening your browser and searching for Postgre. Then, navigate to the official Postgre website and click on the download button. Choose the appropriate platform for your computer. Since I'm using Mac, I will choose this option. Next, click on the download installer link and you will be redirected to the EDB website. Choose the version of PostgreSQL you want to download. We will be using version 15.2 for this tutorial series. Once downloaded, double-click on the setup file and click on Next for each step, keeping all the default settings as necessary. Make sure to close pgadmin before installing. Once the installation is complete, you can use the included pgadmin tool to connect to your local database. Open pgadmin and set a master password for the application, making sure to note it down somewhere. Then, select the PostgreSQL SQL 15 server that was installed. Postgre will create a user called Postgre by default, and you can define a password for that user. Be sure to save this password somewhere. While we can create tables and perform CRUD operations in pgadmin, there is another tool we can use called TablePlus. Download and install TablePlus for your platform. After installation, open TablePlus and right-click to create a new connection. We will be connecting to a Postgres database, so select that option and give any connection a name. Since we are connecting to a local database, we can leave the host and port at their default values. Test the connection. Yes, we have to give the username and password we set earlier in pgadmin. If we see all green, then it was able to connect to the database. Once connected, we can create a new database or use the default Postgre database. Now we are inside PostgreSQL. To select a database, hit Command plus K. We can create a new database using this new button. For now, we will use the existing default database, which is Postgre. Here, we can right-click on tables and create a new table. Let's give it a name. Add a column called name, which is of type text. To commit these changes, hit this icon. Awesome! We created our first table. Now to add data, click on this data tab. We can double click and add any data and commit them. To complete our project, it is necessary to have two tables in place. The first table is what we call the key value pairs table, which should have columns specifically for key, value, and created on date. The key column refers to a unique identifier that we need to store, while the value column corresponds to the data that we want to associate with that identifier. Lastly, the created on date column represents the timestamp when the data was created. The second table is the media item table, which will hold all the images we wish to save. This table should have two columns, one for ID and another for URL. The ID column should store a unique identifier for each image, while the URL column will be used to store the location of the actual image file. To create these tables, we need to open the Table Plus application and select the local database we want to work on. In this case, we will be using Postgre. Once we have selected the database, we can create a new table called Key Value Pairs. This table should have columns for ID, data type serial, key, data type text, value, data type text, and created on, data type timestamp. Afterward, we can proceed to create the second table, which will hold all the images. This table should have columns for ID and URL, both of which should have a data type of text. In the key value pairs table, 
we will need to save the refresh token under a predefined key. The key name that we have decided to use is Telebot Google Refresh Token. This token will be used to authenticate our application's access to Google APIs. To update these tables, we will need to install the PG package. This package is responsible for handling all queries related to the Postgre database and will allow us to perform all CRUD operations. Awesome! Once we have added the package, we can create a new file to handle all database operations. We will call this file DB Handler. The first step is to establish a database connection and there are two types of connections available. We will be using the concept of pooling, so we need to import the PG package and its pooling method. We will also create a configuration for the pooling with a maximum of 5, a minimum of 2, and an ideal timeout in milliseconds. The pooling method creates parallel threads to handle requests, which improves performance. Based on your server capabilities, you can have as many maximum connections as needed. For now, we will set it to 5, which is reasonable. The ideal timeout is set to 6, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 milliseconds, which is approximately 10 minutes. If there are no requests, the pool will automatically scale down to the minimum number of instances. Next, we need to provide the database name, username and password. For now, we will write the password directly in the file, but later in the series, we will discuss how to improve the security of the application and create a better code to make a connection to the database. To create a connection string, we need to include the Postgre, username, password, host, port number and database name. To establish a connection, we will create a pool connection. Now let's move on to creating a method to update the refresh token in the database. We will call this method update refresh token and export it. The method will return a promise and we will include a try catch block to reject the promise if there is an error. To make any query to the database using this package, we need to include the query text and values. In this case, we want to update the refresh token in the DB, so our query will look like this. Update table name, in our case, key value pairs and set value equal to $1. So $1 is the value which we have to pass, then created on is equal to $2 and where key name is equal to $3. The $1 value is the token we want to update, which we will send as the first argument in the values. The created on is the date we want to update, so we will send the new date as the second argument. The key name is simply the name of the key. To test the changes made to our code, Let's save it and give it a try. To do this, we need to go to our index file and import the method first. In the get method, let's add a new condition where we want to test. We need to provide the value we want to update and return a success message if everything goes well. Once we've made the necessary changes, let's save the file and restart the server. After this, we can go to the browser and test the new changes. If the code works as expected, we should see the success message. To make sure the changes are reflected in the database, we can hit the refresh button. If everything went as planned, we should be able to see the new value we updated, along with the date it was created. To retrieve the value we just updated, we need to write a new method to get it from the database. Let's create a method called getRefreshToken from the DB, which will return a new promise. We can use a try-catch block to handle any errors that may occur and specify the query we want to send to the database. This query will select values and create it on dates from a key value pair table where the key name is equal to Google Refresh Token. After executing the query, we can check if there are any errors and resolve them if there aren't any. To test this method, let's export it and import it into our index file. Then, we can add a new condition to our GET request, get the token from this method, and simply return it. We can try this out in the browser and see if we are getting the value we previously updated along with its created on date. In the previous tutorial, we learned how to gather all the image URLs from Google Photos. Now, let's see how we can save the image URLs in a database. We have two options for updating these URLs. We can either use a for loop to call multiple update statements to our database or use a batch update. The latter method updates all the items in one go. To achieve this, we need to write a functionality that handles updating all the URLs. We can call this method batch write items. 
It takes all image URLs as a parameter and updates them in one shot using the batch update concept. The query for inserting into the media items table and updating the URL column looks like this. We will send an array of values with a type of text and the value is the image URLs. We can export this method and test it out. We can go to our index file, import the method and create a new condition. We can send some testing data with an array of strings and return success if it is successful. Before testing it out, we can check the media items table in our database to see if there is any data. If there isn't any data, we can hit the API to add four items. After that, we can hit the endpoint and check the database to see if the rows have been added successfully. Next, we need to create a method that can pull a random URL from this table. The idea is to pull a random photo from our Google account and post it in our Google Telegram group. We can create a method called getRandomPhoto, which returns a promise. The query for this method is to select URLs from media items ordered by random and limit one. This way, we can pick one random row and execute that query. We can then expose this method and test it out in our index file. We can import the method and execute it in a new condition. Every time we hit this endpoint, we will get a random URL. In conclusion, we have learned how to update the refresh token in our database and how to retrieve it. We have also learned how to update all the items and get one random URL out of it. In the next tutorial, we will put all these things together and build our final application.